Hi, welcome to the presentation on riverine erosion. Uh, the objective is to develop an understanding of methods to evade erosion caused by river currents. Some of the key concepts we'll be covering today include uh, that riverine erosion occurs in a dynamic river system. It includes fluvial erosion and mass wasting, and that fluvial erosion is a function of the erodibility of the bank material, the hydraulic shear stress exerted on the bank material, and the duration of the stress acting on that soil. Another key concept is that resistance to erosion is affected by the soil properties, the vegetation, armoring, weathering, and time. And another key concept, erosion estimates should be based on calibrated models and applied to risk assessments, considering the uncertainty of the estimate. Uh, for this presentation, we'll start talking about river system dynamics. We'll move on to bank retreat processes. We'll look at the linear excess shear equation for estimating fluvial erosion. Then we'll look at some tools for assessing river erosion. And finally, some uh, tips for selecting soil erosion parameters uh, for those tools. And then we'll summarize and conclude. Um, so rivers are part of a very dynamic system. Uh, so rivers adjust toward a dynamic equilibrium that balances the flow, the channel slope, the sediment size, and the sediment discharge. And if there's a disruption in any one of these, it can cause system-wide uh, issues such as erosion. So the erosion that's occurring at a particular site might be part of a larger system uh, issue. <clears throat> so the rivers can have vertical changes, as illustrated on the graphic on the left, where you have repeated cross sections at a bridge showing long-term degradation. Um, the graphic on the far right uh, shows how you can look at a gauge on a river and see that for a given flow, the gauge height or the water surface is, is decreased over time. So this is an indication of channel degradation. And in the middle, you can see some results of a, a sediment transport modeling where it looks at into the future to try to predict what the vertical changes could be in the future. <clears throat> rivers can also change plan form. So rivers have meanders, and these meander bins can translate downstream. They can rotate. They can extend, or they can translate, extend, and rotate at the same time. And an example is on the right where we're mapping the historical apex of a meander on the Sacramento River to estimate its future location. <clears throat> so as rivers flow around a bend, the momentum of the flow tends to cause the flow to concentrate on the outside, the higher velocities to, to concentrate more on the outside of the bend, as shown in this graphic. You can see that as it enters through cross section one, it's more evenly distributed. By the time you get to cross section two, it's fairly evenly distributed. By the time you get to cross section three, you can see that the higher velocity is towards um, the left uh, of section three as shown on the screen and you start getting some helical flow. So you get some cross current going across the top of the channel and some going underneath at the bottom of the channel coming in the opposite direction. Um, so if you're computing the near bank velocity which is, and shear, which is very important for erosion, you need to understand the system of this helical flow going around a bend. Uh, also note that uh, you can correct 1D model results using uh, a method by Sclafani et al. for uh, uh, correcting results from a 1D hydraulic model to account for the helical flow pattern. And a word of caution that the flow patterns can actually change with increasing discharge. So here's an example at 40,000 CFS on the bottom of the screen. You can see that the flow is predominantly on the outside of the bend in the deepest part of the channel, but at 160,000 CFS, the velocity that's highest with most of the flow is actually occurring closer to the opposite bank as it has moved uh, due to the momentum of the flow. <clears throat> Another thing to re remember here is that um, 
The near bank velocity and the shear are not constant. There's turbulent fluctuations with time, and you can have downstream changes in the river um, that can occur as well. And so as this is a plot of the stage on the, uh, at the Sacramento American River confluence with the discharge on the American River, and you can see that for a given discharge on the American River, there can be multiple stages on water surface elevations occurring for that discharge. The highest stage for a given discharge is the lower velocity, typically. Whereas for a lower stage, that is typically the higher velocity. So you have to be real careful that the highest stage for a given discharge does not always equal the highest velocity. Uh, 3D flow effects can also increase the near bank uh, velocity and shear that are important for estimating erosion. Uh, this includes bridges um, and trees, as shown in the picture to the right. And here's some uh, figures below from Federal Highways showing the complex flow patterns that uh, can occur around uh, bridge structures and uh, how those can create some very interesting scour and erosion flow patterns. This needs to be considered when you're assessing erosion as well. <clears throat> so riverine erosion is part of a larger scale long-term river system processes. And so when you're looking at riverine erosion, you really need to look downstream, upstream, locally, in the past, and into the future when you're assessing river erosion and understanding the uncertainty of your erosion estimate as well. So some items that can be helpful are listed here. The ones I'll just highlight briefly is going to be, you know, past performance is very important. Uh, looking at dams and diversions uh, and development in the watershed are real important for this as well. Um, sediment transport modeling can be uh, uh, very informative as well for estimating uh, long-term changes in the future. And be sure that there's someone familiar with river system dynamics and erosion that's on the team. So here's some other examples. On the left, you can see an aerial photo where the historic channel has been plotted on top of a aerial photo. So this helps you to see some of the changes that have occurred over time in the past. On the lower right, you can see that there's a graphic showing the flow vectors from a 2D model. Uh, this can give you an indication of whether these high velocities are directed near the levee or at the levee, or they're further away from the bank. Um, and then in the upper right is a surficial geology map that can help you better understand uh, the erosion characteristics of the bank soil and how those might vary over, uh, spatially over your project area. We're now going to look at bank retreat processes and uh, failure modes. So bank retreat results from an interactive process of uh, the removal of the soil by the flowing water, which we're calling fluvial erosion, and slope stability failures, mass wasting. Uh, this is interactive. The fluvial erosion leads to steeper and or higher banks, which induces a slope stability failure. Um, now here's a sample up here in the kind of the middle that shows that the erosion of the levee embankment and erosion of the embankment or the foundation of the uh, levee can be a little bit different. For example, the, the embankment can extend much further out if there's a floodplain away from the levee and it may take some time to erode that embankment material. Uh, whereas the failure mode that's just right up against the levee, uh, you know, you might need to use the velocities from the floodplain, not necessarily from the channel that maybe is hundreds or thousands of feet away. And this is a sample again of a levee failure mode for, uh, tree where you have the loading. You have a flaw with the channel protection failing, whether vegetation or armor. You then get erosion initiation, which then progresses to the levee. Then you look at uh, detection intervention, uh, such as flood fighting and then a potential breach of that levee as well. And here's kind of some a series of graphics showing that. Here you have a vertical face, kind of a flaw. Uh, then you have some initiation progression. This can occur as part of uh, erosion of the bank or vertical scour of the channel. And over here on the left, we have a map showing the bathymetric changes along the channel over a 10-year period of time, which show where the 
scour has occurred over that time period, which may be very helpful when you're assessing erosion risk as well. Then you have some active uh, toe erosion scour occurring in this picture to the right. Perhaps you have a tension crack that develops at the top. Um, maybe you have some infiltration that raises the pore water pressure. Then you have some shearing that begins. And then, of course, the bank fails and deposits that material on the bank. And then subsequent erosion removes that failed debris. And then you start having bank steepening again, and you have more initiation and progression. Next, we're going to move on to the linear excess shear equation for fluvial erosion estimates. This is kind of the foundation equation that uh, fluvial erosion uh, estimates use. So the erosion distance is equal to the erosion rate times duration. That part is fairly simple. The erosion rate is estimated typically by the linear excess shear equation, uh, which is the uh, erodibility coefficient, sometimes called the detachment rate coefficient, times the difference between the effective hydraulic shear stress on the soil boundary and the critical shear stress. Now I want to kind of stop here and to kind of highlight that we are interested in the effective hydraulic shear stress on the soil boundary, not the shear stress 100 feet or 10 feet or even a you know, five feet out in the channel. We want to know what that shear stress is on the soil particles themselves. So we need to figure out what the effect of hydraulic shear stress is on that soil boundary. <clears throat> now, oftentimes the shear stress is uh, computed by multiplying the density of the water times the hydraulic radius, which is often approximated as the flow depth in natural channels. And uh, for, for shallower uh, grade or not as steep slopes, um, then, then you can use this equation. Um, if you're up in a mountain stream with very steep channels, you need to do something different. So initially, you'll get your applied shear stress from, they say, a 1D or 2D hydraulic model, but we need to adjust that value to determine the effect of shear stress applied on the soil. And then the erodibility coefficient K and, and tau sub C for the critical shear, those are soil properties of resistance. The erosion estimates are very sensitive to these two properties, and we'll get into that a little bit more. <clears throat> so the effect of, to determine the effect of hydraulic shear stress on the soil, we need to account for vegetation and flow around the bends. So there's an equation that we can use to adjust the hydraulic shear stress from the hydraulic model to account for vegetation. And the effect of hydraulic shear stress is equal to the shear stress from your hydraulic model uh, times the ratio of the Manning's roughness value for soil bare soil conditions to an effective Manning's parameter squared. Um, now your effective Manning's end parameter can be determined as the ratio of your uh, your soil grain bare soil Manning's end parameter divided by the square root of one minus the cover factor. And this becomes very helpful when dealing with vegetation because now if your cover factor is zero, that means there's no vegetation. And if a cover factor equals one, that means there's complete protection of the soil. There's no shear stress applied to soil at all. And so you can actually adjust your Manning's in and your shear along your slope, depending on uh, vegetation changes along the slope as well. And then lastly, make sure and adjust for flow around a bin using the Sclafani et al. 2012 uh, uh, method if you're using a 1D hydraulic model. So some factors that are affect uh, the K and, T, K and tau C values is uh, soil plasticity. Uh, you know, the more plastic the soil, the more erosion resistant it is typically. Uh, soil compaction, the more compact it is, the more resistant it typically is. Uh, moisture content. A lot of times, if you have a lot of moisture in the soil, it becomes much more erodible. And the heterogeneity of the soil. You can see that uh, if you have layers of soil, you might have a, a weak layer vertically, and it can change uh, horizontally as well. And then wet, dry, and freeze-thaw cycles are also very important for weathering the, the soil, and that can actually uh, make the soil more erodible and can affect your values for the erodibility coefficient and critical shear as well. Uh, armoring, if you put armor on top of your soil, that of course increases its resistance. Flow duration is one that's often 
overlooked. And so I have this graphic on the right to show that even for good grass cover, which has a allowable velocity, which is similar to allowable or critical shear of about three meters per second in this graphic, by the time you have one day duration of flow, that value is about half the initial value. So flow duration is very, very important. And the vegetation can change these values as well. It can decrease the pore pressure, and then the roots also can increase the, the cohesion in the soil. So looking at this equation, the amount of erosion equals the erodibility coefficient times the difference between the effective applied shear stress and the critical shear stress times duration. Okay, so that whole equation gives you progression. Tau, the applied shear stress minus the critical shear stress tau C, that difference lets you know whether erosion is going to initiate. This equation does not include slope stability failures. Now, if you look at our uh, uh, sample level failure mode, you can see that this equation could cover initiation but you have to make sure you're using values for existing vegetation and soil cover and potentially progression for bare soil. Applying this equation, though, still requires engineering judgment. Uh, this is not an easy, an easy button solution. Now we're going to look at some tools for assessing river erosion. And we're going to talk about three different uh, tools. Erosion initiation screening, the erosion toolbox model, and the USDA BSTA model. So if you want to use the linear excess shear equation just to see if you're going to potentially have erosion, you can use the screening method for that. Um, it's just looking at the difference between the applied, effective applied shear and your critical shear stress. Again, these can come from your 1D and 2D hydraulic models for the applied shear stress, but you need to make sure and adjust those values for flow around a bin and vegetation. The critical shear stress can come from tables. An example is shown here to the right, uh, based on your surface cover. Um, so this is from Fishneck 2001. There's another one, USDA NRCS has one as well that you can use as well. But you have to remember that these tables, these values still need to be adjusted for your flow duration if you have more than about two hours of flow. The advantages to using this method is it's relatively simple and quick. Uh, the limitations, probably the biggest one, it does not address erosion progression. This is just looking at initiation. It doesn't tell you how it's going to progress over time. It has a higher uncertainty, especially if you're using table values. You might have different soil properties than what you have on your project. And these tables are not intended or developed for life safety risk applications. Uh, and they may not have your particular surface cover uh, in this table. And it also has the limitations on the next model we're going to be discussing, which is the uh, Army Corps of Engineer Erosion Toolbox model. So this model um, uses that excess linear shear equation that we showed earlier to compute erosion uh, initiation and progression. Again, the, the, the the applied critical shear stress can come from one or two D models. We need to adjust that value for the effective applied shear stress on the soil. And then your critical shear stress can come from tables or default values in the in the model itself, or even more uh, advantageous to use actual measured values from your project site. The advantages is it's less complicated than some more comprehensive models, like the next model we're going to be talking about, the BISTA model. Um, it does include armor and vegetation cover, and it does include progression and wind wave erosion. Uh, one of the limitations, it does not include slope stability failures. It does not include multiple soil layers. It uses a simplified hydrology, and there's no probabilistic bank retreat estimates similar to what we get from the BISTA model. And it also has similar limitations that we're going to discuss in the next model, which is the BISTA model. BSTEM stands for Bank Stability and Tow Erosion Model. It is developed by USDA Agriculture Research Service, and it's an Excel spreadsheet. And it computes the total bank retreat interactively from fluvial erosion, again using the same linear excess shear equation, and soil stability using the legal, li, <laughs> limit equilibrium methods and method of slices. And the model uh, 
selects the failure mode based on a minimum factor of safety. It repeats kind of fluvial erosion slope stability for each time step. Um, there are different versions of this. The one that's going to be most pertinent to rivering erosion risk is going to be the dynamic version where discharge varies with time. And this model has been incorporated into some hydraulic models, including the chorus HECRAS model and the rear reclamations SRH1D and SRH2D models. We're going to be talking just about the spreadsheet model today because it has some uh, updates that make it, I think, particularly advantageous, advantageous for uh, uh, riverine erosion. Some advantages, it incorporates slope stability failures, uh, including planar failures with or without tension cracks, as well as cantilever failures. And it uses up to five different soil layers with different soil properties. And you can use either 1D hydraulic model or 2D hydraulic model outputs. Has positive or negative pore pressures. Uh, it, the confining effect of flow against the bank is also incorporated. We can use this for wave erosion as well. And probably the biggest uh, uh, advantage is it allows you to use a Monte Carlo type simulation to model the uncertainty of your model inputs and uh, come up with stochastic outputs for total bank retreat. And you can use this to compute the erosion exceedance for certain distances directly from the model results. Uh, limitations, and again, these apply to the previous uh, uh, models as well. No change in hydraulics as the bank erodes. So as the bank widens, typically the velocities will reduce and the shear stress will reduce. The model does not directly account for that. It doesn't include vertical scour that may occur throughout a flood event. Um, it doesn't include local scour such as bridge piers. There's no sediment transport modeling included. It assumes that the eroded material is instantly washed downstream. And if used, uh, you know, the 1D model inputs do not account for 2D flow patterns. Uh, need, and you need two models to really account for the vegetation and armor effects, uh, one for the vegetation armor and one for the bare soil conditions. And just to note that the HECRAS B-STEM uh, version of, of, of this model does include an, interact, uh, an integrated tr sediment transport model that addresses some of these limitations, but it cannot have cantilever failures in the HECRAS version. Here's an example of a B-STEM stochastic output. Uh, in this graphic, the 25th percentile not exceedance value is, a, is, is the line where bank retreat for 500 iterations in this particular case, um, or 500 different combinations of, of, of inputs, the bank retreat would, would uh, not exceed the this line 25% of the time. On the flip side, the exceedance value would be 75th percentile. Some other erosion um, related models to consider, uh, sediment transport models can be very helpful for understanding the vertical changes that some of these uh, bank retreat estimates like B-STEM or the erosion toolbox models don't account for. That includes HEC-6T, HECRAS, SRH-1D, and SRH-2D uh, sediment transport models. If you're in an area where you have a lot of river meanders, yeah, some river meander models may be very helpful, such as SRH meander and meander from Texas A&M. Next, we're going to be talking about selecting soil erosion parameters. So as we noted earlier, the soil erosion parameters, uh, the erodibility coefficient and critical shear stress of the soil, are very, very critical and very, very sensitive for estimating bank retreat. There's a really good uh, uh, document out here recently uh, NCHRP report 915, Relationship Between Erodibility and Properties of Soil. I recommend you look at that for some more detailed information. So these, these erosion properties are oftentimes measured through uh, erosion tests. And two of the more common ones is the jet erosion test and the erosion function apparatus or EFA test. On the right is an example of a jet erosion test on a sample that's collected uh, in our district here. And you can see the before and after. What I want to note on this is if you look at the after, you can see that there's some soil missing between the boundary of the sampler and the rest of the soil. This is indicating that 
some chunks were removed from the soil during or from around the edges of the sample during the test. That means that these results may not necessarily be soil properties, but may be representative of the soil and sampler interaction. So you want to use soil properties that actually represent the soil and the underlying test theory. So it's very critical that you actually look at the test results before accepting them onto your project. And then uh, recent work, just to let you know, by, by our, our district here in the core, has indicated that the JET and EFA tests may produce, at least for certain soils, consistent values of the erodibility coefficient and critical shear stress when they're post-processed consistently and using some improved methods that were developed as part of this project. So post-processing results is critical to get good values. So the erosion function is the relationship between the erosion rate and the shear stress. This is shown on the graphic on the right. And uh, typically you plot the points and you draw a line through the points. The slope of that line is your erodibility coefficient and the intercept is your critical shear stress. This graphic shows three different methods to draw the line through the points. The Blaisdell, the iterative, and the linear regression. Um, which one do you use? Well, I will let you know that typically the, the values that you see in the literature use the Blaisdell method. However, I want to caution, for jet tests, uh, the Blaisdell method tends to underpredict the values of K and tau C relative to what you see uh, on riverine erosion. Likewise, the FA tests for the critical shear value uh, may also have values that are lower than what's observed in riverine erosion. And that's consistent with what we found on our recent project as well. Um, based on the experience that we've had working with these and looking at them and comparing to actual observed erosion, as well as what we'll talk about shortly with this mass erosion regime, we generally recommend using the linear regression method for post-processing the results. Uh, these erosion regimes, if you have a scour hole in a jet test, erosion initiates, then you get rapid deepening of the scour hole in the mass erosion regime, followed by finally it reaches an equilibrium depth. This mass erosion regime is, is, is typically what we would expect to see um, for a lot of the banks out there, you know, during a flood event. If you're going to see a lot of erosion, it's going to be part of this mass erosion regime. Those are the values that you want to be using when you're picking your erodibility coefficient and your critical shear stress. Here's some uh, erosion results from the project. Um, I want to kind of point out, looking at these green dots for the uh, silt, this is all from the same project, should be similar soils. They vary by order three orders of magnitude. This is not an anomaly, this is fairly common. Um, which value do you pick to that best represents your soil error? We have EFA tests that are farther away from the bank line. We have jet tests right on the bank. Which one do you pick? I think this graphic gives a big clue to what we need to do. After we calibrated the erosion model to observe erosion, you can see that the silt, these green dots with the little X's, are now clustering together much better. We have reduced that uncertainty substantially. So how do we select this? You know, the, the, the distribution of these uh, parameters is not normal. These are skewed distributions as shown on the graphic uh, on the lower left. They have a wide range of uncertainty uh, as indicated by this other graphic on the right where we can see for silt, we have about three orders of magnitude as well. This is from a separate uh, data collection efforts, but consistent with what we found for silt as well. So we recommend using multiple site-specific erosion tests to uh, better understand the, the the distribution of the of the erodibility uh, values K and tau C for your project. We also recommend using some sort of Monte Carlo stochastic modeling to quantify the uncertainty of the soil, so you understand what the uncertainty of your erosion estimate is. And big takeaway here. Calibrate the model to observe erosion. That's going to give you the most certainty and the best results that you can feel confident in. And just recently, we've collaborated at the Sacramento District with USDA and other people to develop a consistent calibration process for the BSTEM model that can probably be expanded to other models as well.
Now we're going to summarize and conclude this presentation. Um, so river erosion occurs in a dynamic river system and includes fluvial erosion and mass wasting processes. It's very, very important to understand the system-wide dynamic uh, nature of the river that the erosion is occurring in. Uh, fluvial erosion is a function of the erodibility of the bank material. Um, the hydraulic shear stress that's applied on that bank material and the duration that that flow occurs on the soil. And the resistance to erosion is affected by the soil properties, uh, vegetation and armoring that might be covering and protecting that soil, uh, weathering that can weaken the soil, and time. Uh, erosion estimates should be based on calibrated models and applied to risk assessments considering the uncertainty of the estimate. Uh, calibrated models and calibration is going to give you the most confidence in your erosion estimates. 